Are you guys ready for like one of the most amazing days of your life? I don't know. Are you ready? Yes. Give somebody a high five and say, I am ready for an amazing day. Uh, one of the things that happened when I offered this program to you is I said that I'm going to bring you some of the people who were my mentors, who changed my life. Yes, do you remember that? And that's what I do. I get on the phone, I speak to these guys, so I speak to them fairly often. I, say, I really want you to come and speak with my participants, my attendees, because you helped me so much. And um, the gentleman I'm going to bring on right now, when I was about uh, 23, 24, something like that, um, I was very confused. <laughs> I mean, I said, you know, you do enough drugs, you get confused. I said, right? <laughs> no, I'm only kidding, right? And uh, <laughs> you know what they say about the 60s? What is it, the 60s, right? What do they say? Yeah, if, if I remember if you were there, right? Um, anyways, and I was just going through a lot of turmoil and lots of uh, uh, inner... Um, uh, inner struggles with why I had all this potential, I believed, anyone told me that, but nothing was happening, right? It was like everything I tried, uh, it wasn't right or it didn't fit or I found something wrong with it. And it, it was like this huge struggle. I mean, I was even trying door-to-door -door sales, not as a learning experience, but to make some money. You know, it was, it was hard. And I ended up seeing this ad for a course and it looked really interesting. And I decided that I already had nothing to lose. I was just in that place. I said, look, I'll try anything at this point in time. And I went to that course, and um, it, it changed my life. You know, I talk about the mind all the time, right? And we talk about it in, in certain respects with peak potentials, of course. But this was actually one of the first times that I'd ever learned uh, how to use my mind as a tool for attracting what I want. And it was amazing. I remember I was uh, already doing, started to do some building with my dad, as I told you about yesterday. And immediately, as soon as I came home, I started putting the tools into practice. Into what? Practice. One more time. Into what? Practice. Into practice. And things started shifting for me so fast. And my life has never been the same since. The gentleman I'm going to bring up to share with you today is one of my teachers, one of my mentors, one of the most beautiful hearts and spirits on this planet. And as I said to the Success Tracks members, he is one of the rare individuals who actually walks his talk. Walks his talk. He's a beautiful, beautiful man, incredibly successful using the technologies that he's um, created. How many people have heard the term mind power? This gentleman coined that term. This gentleman wrote the book on mind power. This is the original mind power guy, so to speak. What I'm looking for here is just a little, 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 very courteous welcome, if you'd be so kind. A very little courteous welcome. For my friend and teacher, Mr. John Kehoe! Thank you! <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Woo. Thank you. Well, <laughs> hey, it's uh, great, to, uh, great to be here this morning. I uh, got to uh, have a little session, I guess, with the Success Track people on Thursday. We had some fun together. 
So um, this morning what I'm going to be uh, talking about is I'm going to be talking about uh, the powers of the mind. And uh, this is a subject that I'm absolutely passionate about. Twenty-five years ago, uh, I discovered some very interesting intricacies about the human mind and the human psyche and how the powers of the mind can begin to influence and affect the things that happen to us in our life. And this was a revolutionary concept for me. It, it, it made me understand our purpose, our destiny, our personal power. And in order to work with the powers of the mind, you have to understand, first of all, that everything in physical reality is made up of vibrations of energy. This stage here is made up of vibrations of energy. The seats that you're sitting on is made up of vibrations of energy. The clothes that you're wearing are made up of vibrations of energy. The walls are made up of vibrations of energy. That everything in the physical universe is made up of vibrations of energy. Everything. And our thoughts also are vibrations of energy. Our thoughts are the most dynamic, most fluid, most powerful substance in the entire universe. And when you begin to think a thought over and over and over again, imprinting it on the conscious level, what happens is this begins to make an imprint into the subconscious. And once it begins to imprint into the, into the subconscious, it's like a tuning fork, a vibration of energy attracting to you the people, the circumstances, the events, the synchronicity that matches the images that you have within. You have very real power to create and manifest once you understand the dynamics of consciousness and physical reality and you begin to train and practice with the natural powers that each and every one of us have been born with. You see, everything is, is, in, in our life is made up, we're living simultaneously in two different worlds. This is, the, this is the place that we're going to start at this morning. We live simultaneously in two different worlds, not one. We live in the inner world, the world of our thoughts, beliefs, and reactions. And we live in the outer world, the world of circumstances and situations. Um, and right now, this very moment, uh, you're here in the inner world, uh, you're here in this room. And in the outer world, you're here in this room right now. I mean, you're sitting on the seat, you're here. Uh, the outer world consists of me up on stage, the people beside you. All this is happening right now in the outer world. And in the outer world, you're here in this auditorium. In the inner world, you're also here because I have your interest. But if you were to uh, lose interest in what I have to say, if I was to become boring, for example, you might very well remain here in the outer world out of politeness, but in the inner world, you could go to an entirely different place. Maybe uh, thinking about something that happened to you uh, um, earlier on yesterday, or maybe thinking about what you're going to be doing when you go back home after this conference is over. And we do this all the time. We go to different places in the inner world. I mean, how many times, for example, you're, you're driving your car, and you're sitting there on the seat, and uh, in the outer world, you're in the car. But in the inner world, you're an automatic. You know, you're kind of driving along. And maybe you're thinking about a, a disagreement that you had with somebody. And you're thinking about what's going to happen when you see this person next. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, when I see this person, I'm going to come up to them and I'm going to say, yeah, but what about this and that and this and that and this and that? And they're going to come right back to me and they're going to say, yeah, but what about that and this and that and this and that? But I know exactly what I'm going to say because I'll come right back and I'll say, yeah, but what about that? And what about this? And what about that and this and that? Yeah, and he's going to come back and he's going to, yeah. And, and there you are having this total fictitious <laughs> argument, you know. As if it's going to happen like that. It's not going to happen that way. And yet there you are in the inner world acting it out. 
And that's what goes on in our mind is it's very important if you wish to master and understand mind powers that you understand the difference between the outer world and the inner world. Let me do a little example here. Um, can I have a volunteer quickly? Somebody, somebody. Yeah, you. No, this one right here. This one right here. Come on. Okay. Now, I want you to um, just sit down there, Daniel. Okay, now, Daniel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick you. <laughs> and um, I'm going to kick you right here on the shin. And I won't hurt the pants at all, but, um, but it will hurt. And the whole idea of this is, uh, for the sake of the experiment that I'm doing, the whole idea is for me to cause you pain. <laughs> and it will hurt, and it will hurt a lot. <laughs> yeah. So just brace yourself. Get the thing there. Okay. Now, here, let me get a little run at this, actually. Here. <laughs> okay. Here we go. You ready? It might move. Okay. <laughs> Done. Thank you, Daniel. Now, let me just reenact what happened there because this is a very good example of inner and outer world. What happened in the outer world, I announced that I was going to kick Daniel. That happened in the outer world. In the inner world, different things were going on. For example, in, uh, uh, in your inner world, uh, half of you are going, kick him, great. <laughs> and the other half of you are going, mm, this is interesting, you know, I wonder where this is going. Um, in Daniel's inner world, an entirely different thing is going on. I mean, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of apprehension, a lot of fear. Part of them is saying it must be okay, and the other part of them is going, this is really weird. <laughs> you know, last time I take a front row seat, <laughs> and I'm never volunteering for anything again. And, and as I'm emphasizing, you know, I'm going to be causing you pain and it will hurt and it will hurt a lot, I'm watching Daniel's eyes kind of glass over, you know what I mean? Like, oh God, what am I into? So in, in his inner world, there's a lot of confusion, worry, apprehension, all that is going on inside of his inner world. Now, in my inner world, an entirely different thing is going on. I'm having a tremendous time. I'm enjoying it. I know the whole thing is not going to happen. I know I'm not going to kick Daniel right now. I know that... <laughs> I know that comes later on in the morning, you know. <laughs> May as well keep him on edge, you know. So, so I'm having a great time. I'm enjoying myself. And this is what happens in our life is that things happen to us in the outer world and we react to them in the inner world. You know, uh, you, you, um, your boss comes up to you and says, uh, I really like the work you're doing. We're really pleased. We would like to give you a promotion and a raise. Something good happens to you in the outer world. You react in the inner world. Uh, the exact opposite happens. Your boss comes up to you and says, you know, we're really unhappy with the work you're doing. We're going to have to let you go. You, you, you get fired. So that happens in the outer world. In the inner world, you react. You know, you start to doubt yourself. You start to worry. You start to fear. Your self-esteem goes down. All that happens in the inner world. You have a fight with your husband or wife or your girlfriend and, and, or boyfriend. That happens in the outer world. And what happens? You react to it. Okay, that's it. The thing's over. I don't even know what we're doing together. It's a disaster together. And then you make up. Oh, my God. What a great relationship. Well, oh, don't we have something special, baby, you know? I, <laughs> you know? 
And, and somebody compliments you and says, oh, you're looking really good. I like the way you've done your hair. You know, you get a compliment. I like the outfit you're wearing. You get up. Someone else later on the day comes and says, God, you look like hell today. Are you sick? Are you sure you're not sick? You look terrible. And you react in the inner world to that stimulus. And that's what's going on in our life is that we're living in reaction. We're living in reaction because nobody has ever taught us. Nobody has ever explained to us before that we live simultaneously in two worlds. This is crucial that you get this. Two different worlds. Never think of it as one world that you're living in. You're living in the outer world, the world of physical phenomena, the world of circumstances and situations, and the inner world, the world of your thoughts and consciousness and beliefs and reactions. And what happens is we get transpired, just completely overwhelmed with the outer world. When things are going well in our life, we feel great. When things are going bad in our life, we're super down. If you're a, um, you know, a $25,000 a year salesperson, if that's what you make, then that, that's your reality in the outer world. Then what happens is you take it and you run it around in the inner world over and over. Make $25,000 a year, that's what it is, $500 a week, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're always thinking about it. It becomes part of your consciousness. It becomes part of your vibration. If you're having problems in your personal relationships what ha in, in the outer world, that happens in the outer world. Your problems with relationships. That happens in the outer world, not the inner world. But if it's happening in the outer world, what happens? You run it around in the inner world. Think about, oh, God, I'm having so much problems in my relationships. In fact, relationships are really hard to have, aren't they? In fact, I can't think of one person who has a good relationship. Yeah, relationships are really hard. And you're always thinking about the negative aspect of relationships. That becomes your consciousness. That becomes your vibration and energy. And as a result, you have no power. None. Zero. You are caught like a puppet according to what outer world is dictating to you. And that's what mind powers teaches you how to do, is it teaches you to move beyond reaction into personal power. Recognize that we live simultaneously in two totally different worlds, the inner world and the outer world, and learn to distinguish between the two. Learn to understand the dynamics. Each has its own laws. Each has its own dynamics. Each has its own reality. For example, confidence doesn't exist in the outer world. I mean, did you bring some confidence with you this morning? You got some in your purse? You know, confidence doesn't exist in the outer world. Confidence is part of the inner world. Fear does not exist in the outer world. Happiness does not exist in the outer world. There is no happiness in the world. Everybody wants to be happy. Everybody's looking for happiness. There is no happiness in the outer world. Happiness is part of the inner world. So what the student of mind powers does through training, through practice, through understanding, through contemplation, through personal work, learns to distinguish between these two realities that we are living simultaneously, the outer world and the inner world, not confusing them, and learning how to use the one to manifest and create in the other. Because you see, all is law. All is cause and effect. The great law of cause and effect is happening everywhere in the universe, like the planets that are orbiting around our sun, following the same elliptical patterns that they have for millions of years, not changing one iota. Some of them take thousands of days to orbit around the sun. This particular one that we're on takes 365 days to orbit around the sun. And it's all governed by laws. 
The law of gravity says when I throw this up, it's going to come down. It's a law. The tides of the ocean are pulled in and out twice every day by the attraction of the moon. It's the gravitational pull of the moon that is causing the mighty oceans to ebb and flow. And you can take the most isolated bay here on, in, in British Columbia, up in northern British Columbia, maybe up in the Queen Charlotte somewhere, the most isolated bay, and you can predict exactly where the tide is going to be at 2.30 a.m. this upcoming Christmas Day. Because it's all governed by laws. Everything in the universe of ours is governed by laws. The speed of sound is 750 miles an hour. And sound always travels at 750 miles an hour. Not when it feels like it. Not when it's a good mood and up for it. You know, I mean, it's a law that, that, that sound travels at 750 miles an hour. My voice is coming to you right now at 750 miles an hour. That clap is coming to you at 750 miles an hour because sound travels at 750 miles an hour. It's a law, and it always travels at 750 miles an hour. Except, of course, when it's underwater. And then it travels at 3,000 miles an hour. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that it's not governed by laws? No, what it means is that the molecular structure of air and the molecular structure of water is different. And it just so happens that sound travels through water much quicker than it does through air. But it's all governed by laws. The reason that some things are cotton and some things are steel and some things are wood have to do with the way elements bond with one another. For example, when you get different elements bonding in different ways, it shows up as different substances. When you get two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O, bonding together, that shows up as water. And this is how our physical universe manifests itself, by the bonding of elements. The reason that some people are, are white and some people are oriental and some people are, are black uh, some people have blue eyes, some people have dark eyes, has to do with the genetic chromosomes that you get from your parents. We get 23 chromosomes from each parent, and that's why we look the way that we do. Nature can only work with the material that it has. Everything in our universe is governed by laws. Everything from the infinitely large, from our galaxies, that are going to burn out and our great sun's going to burn out in another couple hundred million years to subatomic particles that collide within one another and form other particles. Everything from the infinitely large to the infinitely small is governed by laws. Everything in this universe of ours is governed by laws. Everything. Except, of course, the things that happen to us. <laughs> That's all luck. Good luck and bad luck. Some people are lucky. Fate. Does it really make sense that everything in this universe is of ours is governed by laws and we're the one exception? I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but are we, are not we in the universe too? I mean, we're not living back in the Newtonian age where man was like separate and independent of the universe, like there's the universe and man's separate upon it, acting upon it from afar. Hey, we've come a long way from that. We're in the universe too. We are part of the universe. And if everything in this universe is governed by laws, then I would strongly suspect that there are laws that govern the things that happen to us in our life as well. 
Only we've never understood the laws. That's why we've called it luck or fate or chance. Oh, there are very specific laws that govern what happens to you in your life. And I'll share with you one of the most important laws that you can ever know about yourself and your life. And that is that you are the cause of everything that happens to you. That you're it. And you might say, well, wait a second, John. Uh, you don't know me. <laughs> and you don't know the things that are going on in my life. I'm certainly not causing these things to happen to you, to me. Well, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Uh, you are the cause of everything that is happening to you in your life, that you're it. And... Immediately when I say that, uh, people start saying, yeah, well, what about that? What about people starving in Ethiopia? What about the people that died in the World Trade Center? What about people getting sexually abused when they're young children? What about them? Yes, what about them? Well, for a moment, I want you just to let that go. And there are very clear answers to that. Very, very clear answers to that. But I'm not going to touch that right now. I'm going to just talk about you. I'm talking to every single person that is sitting here in this seat. And what I'm saying to you is that you are the cause of what's going on in your life. Who and what we are is an accumulation and conglomeration of all the experiences all the thoughts, all the beliefs, all the reactions, everything that has happened to you ever since you've been a young infant, every experience, your reaction to that experience, every thought, every action, everything that's happened to you in your life has built within you a vibration of energy. And life is always responding to you according to your vibration and energy I have the John Kehoe vibration of energy and it creates my John Kehoe reality Daniel has his vibration and energy and it creates Daniel's experience Susan in the back has her own particular vibration and energy and it creates Susan's reality that we are the cause, that we are the vibrational frequency that attracts experiences to us. And it's hard for us to understand this at first. And by the way, these things aren't necessarily easy to understand. And we like to, to try and pretend that our life doesn't have anything to do with us. You know, like, here's me and there's my life. And why is it following me around? Get away. My life has nothing to do with me. Get away. My life has nothing to do. We like to pretend that we and our life are totally different things. What do you mean your life has nothing to do with you? Your life is a reflection of you. Your life is a perfect reflection of you. Perfect. And it's a little bitter pill for us in the beginning to accept that we are the cause of the things that are happening to us, especially when things are not going well, perhaps with our health or our finances or our relationships. But I'll tell you something. As soon as you can accept it, not necessarily understand it. I don't expect you to understand it at the first hour of us working together. But once you can accept it, what happens is it gives you power. It gives you an immense amount of power. Because if what I say is true, if indeed 
You are the cause of the things that are happening to you. That means you're it. And my friends, this is the best news anybody could ever give you. I am the bearer of good tidings this morning. <laughs> what I want you to be is I want you to take into this study of mind powers and I hope from this morning's talk that you're going to pursue it further and, 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 and really get to know and understand how mind powers work. What I want you to do is I want you to take into your mind power exploration the attitude of the, sci of the scientist, of the experimenter, of the philosopher, of the adventurer. And be prepared to let go of new and old concepts and beliefs that are no longer serving you. And one of the most impotent beliefs that we can have is that life has nothing to do with us. That it happens abstractly. There's nothing abstract about it at all. You know, for the longest time, science believed that... Um, well, first of all, science is forever letting go of its most cherished beliefs and concepts as new information comes to it. Science has no problem throwing out old models as new information comes to them. They're doing it all the time. They're constantly, you know, reinventing and rediscovering what reality is made up of. For example, for the longest time, uh, mankind believed that the Earth was the center of the solar system and that the sun revolved around the Earth. And it's very easy to see how they believe that. You know, because when you wake up in the morning, the sun's over here. At, you know, lunchtime it's over here. In the evening it's over there. It certainly appears to us that the sun is moving. Just like it appears to us that it's luck and fate and chance, the things that happen to us, I agree. That's the way it appears to our senses. And yet in the 16th century, along came a man called Copernicus. And through his mathematics and through his telescope, he proved absolutely that it wasn't the earth that was revolving, or, or rather it wasn't the sun that was revolving around the earth, but it was the earth that was revolving around the sun. And now I, I believe that. Everybody here believes that. I mean, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that the sun is moving around the sun. But I don't know about you. I have never once seen this planet move. I haven't. Never once. And yet every time I look up into the sky, I see the sun in a different place. Providing it's there. It is Vancouver. You know, so, so what happens is that what I believe that the earth is revolving around the sun, even though it defies my senses. I believe something that defies my senses. And yet I believe it. I really do believe it's the earth going around the sun. Makes no sense, but I believe it. So believing something that defies your senses has a precedent. And I'm asking you to believe something else that defies your senses. I'm asking you to believe and accept that you are the cause of the things that are happening to you. That you are a vibrational frequency in the web of reality that is causing everything to happen to you. You're it. 
And I'll tell you, this is fabulous. Yes, it's a little bitter pill in the beginning, but once we get over that aspect of it, we can begin to move with such personal power, manifesting and creating in ways that I'm going to show you. You know, Einstein's most famous equation of E equals MC squared. What Einstein is explaining in that is he's equating energy and matter. He's saying energy and matter are a constant. That if something appears to disappear, it's really transposed and reappears on a different energy, a different dimension. For example, um, you have some wood and you burn the wood. Okay, what happens? The wood disappears. But as a result of burning that wood, it creates heat. And the amount of heat is exactly proportionate to the amount and type of wood that is burned. It is all governed by laws. You have a mouse that's running down into the forest. And an owl sees this mouse and it comes down and it pounces on the mouse and eats it. No more mouse. Mouse is gone. But as a result of eating the mouse, the owl gets to fly around and hoo, hoo, hoo. What a pitiful owl imitation that was. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying, though. The, the owl gets to live as a result of eating the mouse. And that's what Einstein is saying. Einstein is saying that we live in a universe where all is cause and effect, where all is law. So if this is the type of universe that we live in, what I would like to know is what is the effect of thinking thoughts? What are these very mysterious things called thoughts that are going on in our mind each and every day? And what you're going to find out is much to our amazement and I've been working in this field 25 years now, and I am still in awe of the power of thought. When understood and directed in ways that I'm going to teach you. Thought is the most incredible substance, but we never ex get to experience it with our mind vague and diffused and thinking thousands of thoughts the way it naturally does. So what you need to do is you must become aware of how your consciousness works. And there's three interesting features that I want you to know about the conscious mind right now. First of all, let me say that the beginning of all wisdom is when you realize how much you don't know. That's the beginning of wisdom. When you can say to yourself, quite honestly, that there is so much I don't know, and really mean it, that is the beginning of wisdom. And what you're going to find out in your pursuit and study of the powers of the mind is that there is a whole lot about our own mind that we do not know. A whole lot. Three interesting features I want you to become aware of this morning. The first interesting feature of the conscious mind is that it is in constant motion. You are always thinking thoughts. Always. You're, 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 you're either taking in the information that is happening, for example, right now, you're absorbing information, going over the information, processing the information that I'm talking about, or you're thinking about something in the past, or thinking about something in the future, or imagining some scenario, but your mind is always active. And that's the first thing to become aware of. It's in constant motion. You are always active with your consciousness. The second interesting feature of the conscious mind is that it's what I like to call the great trickster. Your mind is the great trickster. Now, what do I mean by the great trickster? What I mean is that it tricks you, it fools you, it limits you, 
It deceives you in innumerable ways. Our mind is in every sense of the word, and I love that term, the great trickster. For example, you've got a man sitting at home. He's uh, uh, watching TV. Suddenly he gets these bad abdominal pains, rushed off to the hospital, lying there in the hospital thinking to himself, I wonder what's wrong with me. And then as soon as the thought comes to him that perhaps this is going to be serious, he begins imagining in his mind him losing his job. And he can see his boss come up to him saying, I'm sorry, Frank or Bill or whatever his name is. We can't hold your job for you any longer. Uh, he, he imagines himself losing his job, the bills coming in, bank account dwindling, his wife having to go out and look for work, the neighbors looking after the children. And he acts out this whole scenario, suffering with it, agonizing with it, living it as if it's really happening to him now. And what happens? Next day, he's released. Good as new. Nothing wrong. Maybe some indigestion, ate too much fast food or something, maybe. And he just carries on with his life, quite happy that nothing was wrong. And yet, what was going on inside his mind to make him think like that? And think about it in your own life. How ma think about how many times you've suffered and worried needlessly over something that never happened to you. And yet, you work yourself up about it. And our mind's like that. It's the great trickster. And our mind knows us oh so well. Our mind knows things about us that we have not told anybody. Our mind knows our deepest inadequacies. Our mind knows our fears. Our mind knows every intricate little detail about us. And it likes to play with us the way a cat plays with a mouse. And your mind will take the greatest fear that you have and it will project it up to you and it will say, guess what's going to happen to you? And it makes us deal with it. So often our mind will tell us things are going to happen to us and they don't happen to us. And yet our mind tells us that these things are going to happen to us and they don't happen to us. So often our own mind who lies to us, tells us outright, flagrant lies that we can't even believe what our own mind tells us. I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to repeat it because if you get this, if you truly get this, this is the first step to personal power. And that is that you can't always believe what your own mind tells you. Because your mind is the great trickster. It will trick you. It will fool you. It will deceive you in innumerable ways. And from this point on, we begin to doubt our doubts. From this point on, we no longer have to listen to every single thing that it says because we can say to our own mind right now, is that you, great trickster? Aha, uh -huh. who told you about that? Well, it just so happens that that's the dynamics of who and what we are and our consciousness. And how has it happened? It's happened very simply. It's happened because our consciousness is not working the way it was designed. 
our consciousness through neglect is running. The third interesting feature of the conscious mind is that there is a lot of useless thought going on inside it. Useless thought. What do I mean by useless thought? Um, fe fear is useful thought. You know. Now, let me qualify that. There's, there's a role and place for fear in our life. For example, if you go to the zoo, it is a very good, healthy fear that you don't jump into the lion den. You know. If you didn't have that fear, you might end up being a little living example of E equals MC squared. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, so, I mean, fear has its role and place in our life, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's like we're afraid to approach somebody that we don't know, afraid to try something new, afraid of what might happen to us in the future. There's a lot of fear in this consciousness. There's a lot of worry in this consciousness. There's a lot of anxiety in this consciousness. There's a lot of negatives in this consciousness, and I'm shortly going to tell you how to work with negatives, but there's a lot of negatives in this consciousness. So what's happening in our life is we are living our life, our very important life. I mean, this is it. This is not the practice run. This is it. This is our life. And it's a very important life, and we are living this life through a mechanism that is in constant motion, through a mechanism that is tricking us, lying to us, deceiving us, through a mechanism that has all this useless thought going on inside us. And that is the lens through which we perceive our life and our world. And so what happens? We wake up in the morning, instantly our mind goes on, we begin thinking thoughts, and all these thoughts are happening to us, and what am I going to do with my life? What's happening? Then we're at work, and we have a personal problem at work, and then, you know, maybe I should just up and quit this job. I don't even know what I'm doing with this job, you know, but hey, maybe that's a great trickster. I don't know. Hey, actually, that's that problem. Get and then we got all kinds of things, you know, and going to, you know, I'm thinking about vacation, then I'm thinking about this, and then, then, then you can go home and have a little fight with the wife, and I don't know if there's a relationship going on, but hey, we make up, and then everything's fine, and all the, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, and that's, I've got so many projects at work, and then you get up in the next morning, the mind's going all the time, all these things happening and some of them go naturally I'm feeling great good this morning and then something happens in the afternoon I'm really down the afternoon <laughs> is it any wonder that we get a little bit overwhelmed in our life <laughs> and the thing is that is what is going on this is how our consciousness is working without training. We've lost control. We have totally lost control. But you can get control of it. You begin to get control as soon as you can awaken to the fact that this indeed is what is happening. You can begin to get control. In fact, that's what Mind Powers is all about. Mind Powers is techniques, training, methods of gaining control of your consciousness. And one of the things that the student of Mind Powers learns how to do is to eliminate all the negatives that are happening in our consciousness. And even the most positive person has a whole bunch of negatives going on. We all have negatives in one area or another of our life. And I want you to understand that it makes absolutely no difference to the conscious mind whether you think constructive thoughts or destructive thoughts. It makes no difference to the mind. It makes all the difference to you. It makes all the difference to your life. It makes all the difference to the things that are going to happen to you, but it makes no difference to your mind. Now, here I'm talking about you and your mind as if they're different. And that's what you're going to find out is that you are not your mind, just like you are not your hand 
or you are not your foot. Your hand is a part of who you are, but you're not your hand. Likewise, you are not your mind. And it makes no difference to the mind, none to the mind, whether it thinks constructive thoughts or destructive thoughts. It will simply work with whatever material is going through. So the student of mind powers understanding this makes a very diligent effort to eliminate the negatives. So there are four good techniques uh, that I'm going to share with you this morning. Four very good techniques for eliminating negatives from the conscious mind. The first technique is called cut it off. You know, ever since that Bobbitt affair, <laughs> I always have that little second of squeamishness, uh, you know, as I may be. Okay, the cut it off method. What you do is the instant that you recognize that you're thinking negative thoughts, the instant, what you do is you just cut it off and insert a totally different thought into your mind. You don't argue with it. You don't analyze it. You don't defend yourself against it. What you do is as soon as you recognize it's a negative thought, and you do it right mid-negative, maybe the thought's coming, ah, you're worthless, and the whole life is, I'm wrong. Just cut it off. Don't even let it finish. Cut it off and insert a totally different thought into your mind. That's the first technique, the cut it off technique. Now, the second technique is totally different. These are four totally different independent ways of dealing with negatives. First technique, cut it off. Second technique, what you do is you label it. You label it. You say, what is happening in me is I am now experiencing, quotation marks, a negative thought. I'm now experiencing a negative thought. And you label it, but you don't get caught up in it. And I'm going to share something with you that once you understand this next principle, you are 75% of the way of eliminating negatives from your life. 75% of the way of eliminating negatives by understanding this next truth. And I'm going to say it three times because I want it to imprint deeply into your consciousness. I want it to burn into your consciousness. I want you never to forget this. And here it comes. Negatives only have power over you if you react to them. Negatives only have power over you if you react to them. Negatives only have power over you when you react to them. If you cease to react to the negative, it has no power over you. You see, negatives are like psychic leeches. Negatives get their power from you. That's where they get their power from, from you. Like when the negative comes to you and you go, oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh, if that ever happened, oh, I can just see it happening. It's got you. It draws its power from you. If you cease to react to it, it has no power. So when the negative comes to you, what you do is you immediately label it. You say, okay, what's happening inside me is I am now experiencing, quotation marks, a negative thought. 
And you keep reminding yourself, it's only a negative thought, it's only a negative thought, it's only a negative. And maybe it's this great big monster negative, and you have to kind of dance around it like, whoa, look at that. Whoa, it's only a negative thought. Whoa, it's only a negative thought. Whoa, it's only a negative thought. It's only a negative thought. It's only a negative thought. You know? You know, you might have to dance around it in your mind a little bit, but you keep reminding yourself that it's only a negative thought. It has no more power other than what you give it. The third technique is exaggeration. And in the exaggeration technique, what you do is that whatever the negative is, you exaggerate it into ridiculousness. And the key is ridiculousness. Like, let's say that um, you're a salesperson and you're out in your sales calls and suddenly the thought comes to you, ah, what's the use? Um, I'm not going to make another sale today. It's, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not going to make any more sales. I know that. And then you catch yourself and say, wait a sec, that was a negative thought. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful to know that our mind is the great trickster. Isn't it wonderful to know that it will trick us sometimes so we can catch it? And that's what's going to happen to you now. You'll catch your mind simply throwing nonsense up at you. And you'll say, aha, okay, it's a negative thought. That's fine. I know how to deal with it. Uh, I think I'll use the exaggeration technique on it. And in the exaggeration, whatever it says to you, you exaggerate it into ridiculousness. You say, that's right, I'm not going to make another sale today. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised that when I go to this next company, I'm probably going to open up the doors, and immediately there's going to be this mechanical boxing glove, and it's going to come out, and it's going to smash me in my face, and I'm going to fall on the ground, and I'm going to be hurt. And then they're going to release pit bull terriers and German shepherds and Doberman pinchers, and I'm going to be bit, and I'm going to be hurt. And then probably they're going to have pails of water and they're going to throw these pails of water at me and I'm going to be wet and I'm going to be bit and I'm going to be hurt. And then probably everyone's going to leap up on their desk and reveal this great big banner that says, You fool, why did you come here? Mm. Now, that's ridiculous. But when you do that, what happens is it takes the power away from it. Because once again, let me remind you that negatives only have power over you if you react to them. So any method that you can keep to reacting from it will keep it from having power. Let me give you another example of the exaggeration. Let's say that you're at home and you're throwing a dinner party for, uh, you know, six or eight people and you're right in the midst of uh, uh, trying a new recipe. And you're halfway through the recipe and suddenly the great trickster gets working on you. What's this? Trying something new with all these people coming over? Are you crazy? Look at the things not working out at all. It's going to be a disaster tonight. And, and then you catch yourself, because that's part of mind powers, is being aware that the great trickster exists inside us. And we say, okay, it's just the great trickster, it's just negative thought. I think I'll use the exaggeration technique on it. <clears throat> so you say, that's right, it's not going to turn out. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this whole concoction boils out over the saucepan. It's going to go all over the stove. It's going to go all over the kitchen floor. I wouldn't even be surprised if it goes out and it leaves the kitchen. It's going to go out into the living room, all out over the rug. I, in fact, I think it's probably even going to leave the house. It's going to be out on the street. Uh, you know, you know, there could even be a bad car accident. I might even be in the paper tomorrow. You know, cooking accident causes death. Now. And, and, and so what happens is, is, is your mind goes, oh, don't be so ridiculous. And, and you go, oh, what, is it not going to be in the paper? Not gonna, no, it's not, not going to be in the paper. It's not going to go out. In the, it's not going to go out in the street. Of course it's not going to go out in the street. Well, is it going to go over the living room floor? Of course it's not going to go over the living room. Well, is it, was it going to go over the kitchen floor? Of course it's not going to go over the kitchen floor. Well, is it going to go over the saucepan? I don't know. Aha! <laughs> It 
It doesn't know. Your mind doesn't know that the recipe is going to turn out. Your mind doesn't know that you're not going to make a sale. Doesn't know. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if when negatives came to us, they came with like little warning signals, you know, little bells and whistles, you know, a little buzzer maybe that goes, da, 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 da. Uh, here's a negative thought. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to, but here it is. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that be great? But they don't. When negatives come to us, they come like the voice of God. Guess what's going to happen to you? And, and, and they project the most horrific circumstances into us. The fourth technique is to counteract the negative with the exact opposite. Counteract the negative with the exact opposite. So whatever the negative is, you counteract it with the exact opposite. When the thought comes to you that I'm not going to make another sale, you counteract it with I am going to make another sale today. When the thought comes to you that the recipe isn't going to turn out, you counteract it with the exact 